Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. And believe it or not, we are uh, just nearing the end of our, our work together in the book of Ephesians. Can you believe that? We've been in it for more than a year now. And, uh, and, and we will be, we'll have one more message in the book of Ephesians next Sunday. And, and we're actually finishing up a second part of last week's sermon. Uh, and uh, we're specifically focusing on verse 17 in Ephesians chapter 6 where it says that, that, we have, that we have the Word of God or the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's a part of the armor of God, but on the whole armor of God. And then this last piece is actually a defensive uh, piece and an offensive weapon, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's defense and offense. I, I like being on offense, too, every now and then. I don't, and, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I just want to retrace what we talked about last week. And we, we simply said that Jesus Christ is the Word of God. The, the New Testament uses two words to describe the Word of God. It speaks of, the, the, it uses the word logos, which refers to the total inspired Word of God, and to refer to Jesus Christ, who is the living Word of God. And then it uses also the word rhema, R-H-E-M-A, it's a Greek word from, in the New, that is used in the New Testament to speak of the Word of God. And it is often synonymous with logos, but it, in some instances it refers to a specific word from God in a specific situation within the written Word of God. Go back and listen to last week. I'm not going to retrace all of that. But in verse 17, in chapter 6 of Ephesians, where we are today, the, the word rhema speaks of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And here, rhema refers to, to a word from God, from the whole of God's written Word, for a specific purpose and time, with a specific application to an immediate situation. Now, I know that's all kind of academic. And some of you are sitting there, yeah, you're, you're saying, what does all this have to do with me? Well, really what we're talking about here is we're talking about the fact that God's, the Holy Spirit brings God's Word to the forefront in our life. As we expose ourselves to the Word, He brings it to the forefront in our lives so that in certain situations, maybe in temptation, in times of fear, in times of doubt, in times when we just simply need encouragement, God brings His Word to the forefront and it speaks into our lives in those moments and it becomes that living, active Word of God. It becomes the sword of the Spirit, Word of God in our lives. And, and I think you're going to understand that a little bit more as we, get, as we talk about some very practical ways that that works its way out in our lives. So, last week we said, I want you to awaken to, the, to these essentials when it comes to the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the first point we, we talked about last week, I'm going to go back through these in case you weren't here, so you can fill in the blanks in your handout there that you got in your bulletin. Awaken to the power of the Word of God. And I'm not going to go through all of that. But one passage of Scripture that has to stand out, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, for the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God is living and active. It is powerful in our lives. And, and so uh, with, with that, you know, the second thing we said is we need to awaken to the role of the Holy Spirit to illuminate the, the, the Word of God. The, the Holy Spirit works to illuminate the Word of God in our lives. And, and, and He does that. He did that from the very beginning. The Holy Spirit was behind the writing of the Word, but also in bringing the Word to the forefront, bringing the Word to mind in our lives. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth, Jesus said. So the Holy Spirit works in this way. Then the third thing, awaken to this, a primary way that the enemy attacks is to discredit or misuse the Word of God. We see that all the way down through history, but even as far back as the Garden of Eden, right? Where the, where the serpent, Satan, came to Eve and, and misquoted the Scripture to her. You know, God had said that you are not to eat of the one tree. There's one tree in the garden you are not to eat of. But what did Satan say to Eve? He said, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Is that what God had said? No, he said, not that one tree, one tree, 
You see how Satan does this? Right at the very beginning, he is working to discredit and misuse the Word of God. And then Eve, who was kind of, uh, who, who was a, a little bit naive about this, if you will, uh, who, uh, she misquotes what the Lord said as well. She said, no, the, the Lord said we may not eat of the fruit of the tree, we, that we can eat of the fruit of the trees of, in the garden, but you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. And then she adds to it, and you shall not even touch it. I didn't say that. He just said, don't eat of it. So, you know, all of, all of a sudden she's, she's kind of tricked up here and she's confused. And then Satan moves in and he doesn't just, he doesn't just misquote the word, he outright refutes the word when he says, you will not surely die. God said you'll die. But what does he do? You see what happens here. And he did this with Jesus also in the wilderness, right? Four different times. Satan came to Jesus and he misquoted or misused the Word of God. And what did Jesus do? He spoke the truth, right? He quoted from the Word. He wielded the sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So awaken to this, a primary way that the enemy attacks to discredit or misuse, to, is to discredit or misuse the Word of God. Listen, some of you have fallen for the thought that the Bible is just an old book, really doesn't apply to your life. And, 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 I, and here's how I know that, that, we, that many of us have fallen for that. Because we're not studying with other believers. I mean, if, if it is truly what we say it is, then would we not be immersing ourselves with other believers in the Word of God? Would we not be reading it? Would we not be meditating on it? Would we not... Listen, don't, let's don't fool ourselves, right? We say this is the Word of God to us today, not just an ancient book like the Discovery Channel is going to tell you it is, not just something to be set aside, or not just an historical document, or not just a book among books, but the very Word of God given to us, written for us. And we need, to, we need to understand that how easy it is for us to get tripped up on this and to set it aside. And, and this is a primary way that our enemy works. Remember what I said last week, you know, that it's like he comes to us and he, and he says, that's not a sword. And you say, but I've always been told it was a sword. No, that, that's not a sword. And you put it down and he picks it up and he stabs you with it. And then you say, well, it was a sword. He said, he, he said yes, it, it is. I, I'm a liar. And if you'd read it, you'd know I was a liar. You would understand that I was lying. And, and what we find is that the very word we trip over, the very word that God has given to us to help us to walk straight and to walk strong. And so we need to understand that this is the primary way that our enemy works. Now, number four, awaken to this. The greater the exposure to the word of God, the more the Holy Spirit can use it in our lives. This is why we encourage you to be in a group of people who are studying the Scripture. This is why we encourage you to be daily readers of the Word of God. Even, you don't have to read great big chunks. I mean, different people are going to go at this different ways, and that's great. There's a plan for everybody out there today. I mean, you can go on the Internet and find a plan that you can put to work today. You don't have to start on January 1. You can customize it and homogenize it and pasteurize it and do whatever you have to do, right? And, and I just I just want to encourage you. I, you know, you may be a person you kind of get lost if you try to read great big chunks. That, that's okay. Some of you like to do that. Some of you want to do that. That's good too. But but I would just say don't don't opt out. Find a way and stay with it and dis, be disciplined. Find you a friend who will read along with you and keep each other accountable so that you don't just get to Leviticus and quit. Right? But you stay the course and you, and, and you read it through. And, and I always encourage, somewhere along the way in your life, I encourage you to read it chronologically. How many of you have done that? How many of you have read Scripture chronologically? Yeah, I, I tell you, that will make that will do as much as anything. Those of you who've done it, won't it? I mean, it makes it come alive for you. You begin to see how the Old Testament prophets fit together with the Kings and the Psalms and the and, and in the New Testament how the letters 
that we read of in the New Testament, like the letter to the, to the Ephesian church, fits together in the book of Acts, and how all of that comes together, and, and how, it, you know, it's, it, how relevant it is, and how much it helps you to have it in context, and understand it in context. I encourage you to do that somewhere along the line. Awaken to this, the greater the exposure to the Word of God, the more the Holy Spirit can use it in your lives. And Jesus said this to the Pharisees. He said, listen, you search the Scriptures, and, and you do not even understand that they speak of me. All the way through the Scriptures, the, the Bible speaks of Jesus Christ and, and, and sheds light on Jesus Christ. That's what we said when we talked about the armor of God, right? That the armor of God really is a picture of how Jesus Christ works in our lives. And it is the Scriptures that bear witness of Jesus Christ. Yet the, the psalmist said, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It is a sword that is readily available to us that when temptation comes, when times of, of struggle, fear, darkness come into our lives, the Word is employed by the Spirit, brought forward by the Spirit in our lives, and it speaks into our lives. Yesterday, I got to go over to uh, Central Beard to watch the Bible Grove kids. Uh, and, and they did a fantastic job. I, I want to say, I said this last week, I'll say it again this week. Listen, if you've got to choose between Baseball, soccer, football, and Bible drill. Choose Bible drill every time. Because, you know, I, I, I'll tell you this. How many of you thought, you know, you were gonna, your kids are going to be a superstar and they were going to play a sport and do that the rest of their lives? Yeah? And, and how, many of, how many of you have actually seen somebody do that? Actually known somebody do that? Very few of us, right? But I will tell you this. You'll carry that scripture with you rest of your life as you memorize it. I still, things come to mind that, that I learned as a child and, and they still, they, they're still the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God in my life. The greater the exposure and there's no substituting doing this as a child. How many of you would say, I don't memorize as well as I used to. That doesn't mean, that mean, doesn't mean you opt out of memorizing. memorizing. But it just, it, it's, get, get your children involved and be a part of this. That is a great way. On Wednesday nights, one of the things that is a part of our Wednesday night kids ministry is, is memorization of Scripture. Learning the Scriptures so that they have that sword ready for them. And, and we encourage you to get your kids involved in those things. Now, number five, awaken to the blessing of the Word of God as the sword of the Spirit. Awaken to this blessing of what we're talking about here this morning. In the regular course of our daily reading of God's Word, we need to ask God to speak to us through His Word and give us insight into it. The Holy Spirit can call certain passages to stand out, even to jump out with significant meaning or application for our lives. Now, how many, and I think this is why certain Scripture passages are, are what we would call popular Scripture passages. I mean, if I were to ask you, what is your favorite, what is your favorite, or your favorite verses? Maybe some of you would, you would say uh, Psalm 23 or something like that. Why? Because it's so. Every one of us has walked through a dark valley somewhere along the way in our lives, right? Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and and here this psalm just t transitions from kind of a second person, third person, uh, kind of. A psalm to a first person psalm. I will fear no evil. Why? Because, not just because He is with me. Now it says, You are with me. You are with me. The Lord, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And, and how, many, how many of us have been ministered to through that? That is, a, that is a, a rhema word. That is a word that comes from the written word of God, comes forward in our lives at times of difficulty and darkness. How many of us have had that very same thing happen in our own lives? You know, I, I shared with you many times before that years ago I had to, I had to learn, uh, had to memorize Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Because I, I don't know about you, but I, my tendency is a lot of times to sit around and worry. Anybody else here worry? 
Nobody's just me. Well, anyway, I'll go on with this. But, but here, here's the thing. You know, I, I found myself worrying instead of praying. And when it takes the same, as I've shared with you before, it takes the same energy to pray as it does to worry. And what is worry? It's just kind of your thoughts, all these thoughts going around in your head, right? Around and around your head. You're not solving anything by worrying. Would we agree with that? Jesus said that. You don't add a minute to your life by worry. But, so what do you do instead? Philippians chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Tell it to Him. Instead of sitting and worrying, you're driving down the road and these thoughts are going through your mind and you're thinking worst case scenarios, you're going through all of this, what do you do? Instead, you just release it. You give it to Him. And the great promise, that, you know, this is a tremendous promise, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I, mean, I'm just, I think we can probably just stop right now and have a prayer meeting, right? Yeah, because I would say everybody here in some form or fashion, you have a tendency to worry over something. And what if right now we just stop? We just release that to God and we give it to Him. That rain, that word, that sword of the Spirit word, often comes forward in my life when I find myself just bogged down in worry. I, I was talking to a guy a little while back who was uh, going to... He had an anger problem. I know none of us guys struggle with that, right? But this guy, this guy struggled with an anger problem. And he thought he could solve things in life with his anger. I mean, that's what he, he finally came to realize. I thought I could fix things with, if I just get mad at it, then I could fix it. I could, I could straighten it all out. I could fix the world with my anger. And he said he was in a Bible study one day, and, and he, they read a verse, and he was familiar with this verse, it, it, verse 19 in James chapter 1. Know this, my brothers, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Then verse 20 is what grabbed him. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. How about that? Yeah, that, somebody had to drop their book on that. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. that yeah. And isn't that true? I mean, how, how many of us have ever really solved something with our anger? Now, I know there's such things, righteous anger and all that, but we hide behind that an awful lot. Don't you agree? And, and we, we think somehow I'm going to fix things or I'm going to, I'm going to will it to be fixed by being mad at it. And, and, and what a great word just to kind of release you from that. You don't even have to live in that anymore. The, 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 the will of God, the righteousness of God is not going to be accomplished by your anger, no matter how angry you get, no matter how big a fit you throw Right? Is that, a, is that a sword of the Spirit word for anybody today? Yeah, and, and, and then another, another passage, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words. This passage was talking about sexual immorality and filthiness and, and filthy talk and all these kinds of things. And listen to what it says. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Where does the wrath of God? Why does the wrath of God come? Because of all of these things. And, and, you, and, and as a Christian, Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus. He's saying, why would you want to delve into things and fill your life with things that bring about the wrath of God and the sons of disobedience? And when you start to realize that the wrath of God is not just like God raining down lightning, not just a car wreck or some other <coughs> traumatic thing happening, it's just the disintegration of life. Because of these things, life just disintegrates around the sons of disobedience. Why would you want to invest your life in those things? That's a that's a, a word, a sword of the spirit, word of God to us. And I want to tell you that this this whole uh, idea of the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, is not just something that ha that we bring forward. <clears throat> excuse me, in times of trouble. But it's a preventative word as well. How many people would be would have been helped somewhere along the line if they just remembered that sex outside of marriage is outside of the will of God? The word of God speaks, doesn't it? And it speaks and it tells us and it prevents certain things in our lives. 
What about, you know, I, I had someone talking to me a little while back, and they, and they were going through a difficult time financially, and everybody can relate to that, but, you know, I began to ask them some questions about the managing of their money, and they, they just totally ignored what God says about being generous, about the, the tithe, about bringing what God gives you to the, to the Lord, and, and you know, and then you wonder why everything disintegrates financially around you when you don't do it God's way. God's Word speaks truth to us to prevent certain things so that we will not be greedy, so that we will not mismanage, so that we will not lose our way in the material things of life. And when we ignore it, we ignore it to our peril. But when we call it to mind in that day-to-day -day decision, making process, then it becomes the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It becomes a weapon against what life would do to us, what the enemy would do to us. I, I was uh, talking with a guy a while back who was, who, several years ago, his young daughter died, very, very young, very tragically, passed away. And he said, not long after that, he was just so struggling so deeply with what was going on in his life and what had happened to his family. And he said that he had, he had this Bible study group that he was in. They were studying John chapter 13. And, and, they, and he came across this part right here. Peter is, is, is there with the other disciples and Jesus is washing their feet. And as he washes their feet, Peter says, God, you can't wash my feet. I should wash your feet. And Jesus said this to Peter, what I'm doing, you do not understand that, but afterward, you will understand. Now, that word was a specific word from the Lord to Peter. But the, the, the overarching principle of that word spoke to this guy's life. You can imagine, right? You don't understand why you're going through this right now. You don't understand what I'm doing, but one day you will understand. Somebody should write a song. Right? And, and, and there, there, what we see is the Word of God being employed, being wielded by the Holy Spirit, brought forward in our lives and speaks into our lives. Learn the blessing of that and seek out, seek that out and, and put that to work and let God put that to work in your life. Now, number six, awaken to the essentiality of the obedience, of obedience to the Word of God. But if you're not going to do it, you know, it's just, it's just so much print on pages if we're not going to obey it. Peter wrote, having purified your souls by obedience to the, to the truth. Our souls are purified as we obey. What you learn, obey. James 1.22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Don't just... Don't, for, don't lose sight. I think this is where we weaken ourselves as believers. Is we don't do what we know. We know it and we know it well, but we don't do it. When we begin to, when we begin to obey it, we, we learn to love the Lord all the more. And the more we love Him, the more He makes Himself known to us. And then number seven, awaken to the essentiality of telling what you've learned. Teach somebody. You know, go, go this week and, and share with someone, with a friend, with a, with a family member, with you, you and your spouse. Talk about Talk to your children about this, about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What have you learned today in, in your Sunday school class? Or what have you learned this week in your small group? Talk to somebody. The, the way something becomes concrete and solid in your life is when you begin to become the teacher. And everybody here, in some form or fashion, can be a teacher. Tell what God is, is saying to you, and how He is speaking to you from His Word. It might be from your daily Bible readings. It might, wherever it may come from, share with somebody, and that makes it all the more solid in your life. This thing, obedience and telling, are two facets of this that we so easily skip across. We think it's enough to just be a hearer. The scriptures tell us that that is deceptive. Be doers of the word. And then we are told to tell what we've learned. The Great Commission itself says Jesus came to them, all, all authority in heaven and on earth, 
is being given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's a great commission. And it's not just something we do when we go on a long distance mission trip. It's something we do as we walk through our lives. Parents are instructed in Deuteronomy chapter 6 to tell what God has taught you to your children. Pass it on to them. Let them know how God has spoken into your life. You will, you will enrich their faith immeasurably. I was blessed to have a grandfather that was quick to share what God had, had taught him through the years. And those things still come to my mind. They come to my mind often, the things that I learned. Your kids will be enriched. Your, your family, your spouse will be enriched as you share what God has spoken to you. And then and, and, and this morning, every one of us need to just make it our prayer. Lord, teach me from your word. Put the sword of the Spirit in my hand. Awaken me to the values in my life. Day in and day out. <coughs> Several years ago, when I was a little boy, um, I, uh, I was in a Sunday school class. I was blessed to grow up in church. I was blessed to grow up in a church that believed that the Bible is the Word of God. We fight for that. I mean, we fight for that. And I, that, that was such a blessing. But I remember saying in a Sunday school class, and every now and then our Sunday school teacher would say, now, who, who can tell us a Bible verse you've learned recently? Well, there's nothing to put the fear in a little boy's heart more than that. You know, sitting there, I'm, okay. And, and, but, but thankfully, I got to go first. And I employed that little two-word verse. In John chapter 11, Jesus wept. That was it. And I was done. You know, I was done. About 20 years later, when my mother passed away, and I was reminded that Jesus was. Jesus stood by the grave of his loved one, and Lazarus, his friend Lazarus, and wept. And I think he didn't just weep because of Lazarus. He wept because he saw down through the ages all of the weeping that would come to our lives when our love would stop. And Jesus wept. I can tell you that word meant a lot to me that day. It still does today. To know that I have a Savior who enters into my struggle, enters into my grief, enters into my sorrow, that He is not oblivious to what's going on, in my life today. He's not oblivious to yours. Sometimes it's just as simple as Jesus wept. And it's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I just want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you to find every way possible. You know, turn off the television. Put aside a lot of other things in your life. Because many of us, quite frankly, are going into our day-to-day -day lives unarmed. The scripture says that Satan is like a roaring lion roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. And because we are not familiarizing ourselves with the Word of God, and we're not making that priority in our lives, we're like bait for the lion. And I, I just want to encourage you. There's so many things we would prevent in our lives. There's so much discouragement that could turn to encouragement. There's so much darkness that could turn to light if we would just pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and begin to learn it and obey it and tell it to those around us.